Well, hello there, everyone. It's Christy, and welcome to the third episode of Feminist Talk Back. I'm here today with a very special guest, and so we're having a one-on-one. My guest today is Karen Garst, and she has edited a book. Is that the right title for you, Karen? Yes. The editor of Women Beyond Belief, Discovering Life Without Religion. And from the book, women have made great strides toward equal rights over the past hundred years, especially in the West. But when considering the ongoing fight over reproductive rights and equal pay and the prevalence of sexual violence and domestic abuse, it is clear that a significant gap still exists. With scripture often cited as justification for the marginalization of women, it is time to acknowledge that one of the final barriers to full equality for women is religion. Much has been written about the great strides humankind has made in knocking down many long-held religious beliefs, whether related to the age of the earth or the origin of the species. But religion's negative impact on women has been less studied and discussed. This book is a step toward changing that. 22 women from a variety of backgrounds and Judeo-Christian traditions share their personal stories about how they came to abandon organized religion and how they discovered life after moving away from religious and supernatural beliefs. Their words serve as both the celebration of all who have taken similar steps under the weight of thousands of years of religious history and a source of inspiration for those individuals, especially women, who have deep doubts about their own faith traditions, but who don't yet know how to embrace life without falling back on religion. So Karen, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much for having me back. Yes, so we're gonna talk about your book, but we're gonna start with the tradition that we have here on Feminist Talk Back, which is to answer questions to give uh, people who have questions uh, the space and time for us to give our own personal feminist perspective. And this is also to show that there's a wide variety of people who are feminists and feminists don't always agree on things or they uh, have different reasons for thinking them. So we're gonna start with, uh, we're gonna do two questions today because we have a long show planned since we have Karen here and we wanna spend enough time on her book. But from, and I'm going to really have a struggle with the pronunciation of this. Some Translins Nantha <laughs> writes, question for the next episode. Would you agree that the issue of equality is very polarized? If so, what do you think would happen if we facilitated dialogue between the different poles, understood each other's perspectives, and thus depolarized the issue? Would it lead to more people understanding the points feminists make, or would both camps, feminist and anti-feminist, move more toward each other? So Karen, what are your thoughts in response to that question? Well, I think that on any issue that you have, there's a continuum. And you know whether you wanna say left, right, whether you wanna make that a horseshoe and say the extremes are closer together than the middle, um, you clearly have, um, a lot of differences. I think part of it is the use of the word uh, feminist. It's really changed. We can talk about that later. But in terms of equality, I think most people would say they believe in gender equality. I think the issue is, is whether we have it or not. Uh, One of the authors of my book says, she really doesn't call herself a feminist because she thinks in the United States that women, uh, women have equality. And she talks about you know, men's rights in certain areas. So I think it's really a question of can we agree on the facts and worry less about the labels, I think we'd be better off. Thanks for that. So when I read the question, the thing I thought about was the idea that um, the idea of equality being polarized. And I was thinking back to the very start of feminism back in, well, I'm I'm most familiar with British and American feminism. So in in this case, in the UK, but even in America, but earlier in the UK, there were movements to try to get women the right or access to education. And then there were movements to get women rights to higher education and to vote and to be considered legal citizens in their own rights, independent of their husbands when they married. What equality has been in terms of the sexes has been women trying to be get the same things men have (laughs) and have always enjoyed and that's why equal pay when you the metric are men's pay because women haven't yet attained that so equality itself is not polarizing but i think it's important to think about who is who is occupying the spaces and who wants to join them in those spaces and 
I, I guess the perspective, I, I can't really relate to it, but from somebody who's opposed to this, it might feel like women want more or special rights, but fundamentally, we're still asking for the same things that other people get, and there are differences, there are vast differences that are connected to sex in our society. And maybe those issues become polarizing because they bring in a lot of things, but I don't think feminism or the, the, the movement to raise women's status and have them have equal status and power and economic freedom as, as men do is, is necessarily polarizing. I think maybe some of the other things, it doesn't have to be if you think about it in a slightly different way than um, people taking things from one another. Does that make sense to you, Karen? Yes, and I think some of the, when I get a comment, um, when I post something from my blog, which is called Faithless Feminist, and people don't bother to read the post, <laughs> and they just comment on the name, and I always try to engage them. I usually start out with saying, mm, if they're particularly nasty, I say, what would your mother think of that? <laughs> just kind of to make a little fun of it, you know, and, and move forward and, and engage in a dialogue with them. Often what comes up is uh, a man who's been divorced, who didn't get custody for his kids, uh, probably doesn't make a lot of money and is paying child support um, or where she got to keep the house or something like that. And so they're feeling really disadvantaged by it. Uh, and you, of course, you don't know what the circumstances are. But I think those are some instances um, where men may feel women have more than equality. I don't think that's true, but I think if they're coming from. Right. I, there was a discussion, a video that was put up by uh, the one janitor whom I like a lot. I like his videos and, and I have a lot of you know, respect for him. But he talked about this time, and I've heard other people mention it too, but he just did it recently about uh, when feminists ran the internet and then Gamergate happened and people took the internet away from feminists. And I'm just, I've been on the internet since, you know, like the 2000s because I'm getting old. And I don't remember when we ran the internet. Like I, I, I've been in, and I'd self-identified feminist for that whole time. And uh, nobody contacted me. Like I wasn't asked to use my feminist powers in any way. Um, so I'm just like, I, I don't, so there is this narrative that at least occurs on YouTube that there was this time when feminists ran the internet and or feminists were running YouTube. And I just like, I don't hear a lot of names or channels associated, you know, certainly not in terms of like <laughs> dozens and dozens. Um, yeah. And, and so I think YouTube is the hardest place right now to have a discussion about feminism because of the charged atmosphere and because the, there are people in, in both let's say camps. Um, and I think it's also especially difficult uh, for the smaller feminist channels because generally the anti-feminist channels have 10 times the number of subscribers and very dedicated fans who come over to hurl abuse at you and so you have to try to make your points in the face of that um, uh, like onslaught of you know just like saying oh you have a PhD you shouldn't be making videos about this or you have a PhD you should be making better videos about this like everything you can think about in terms of a criticism gets gets hurled at you daily and you have to do all of this in the face of that. So it's kind of hard to feel like it's a place where we can have a lot of back and forth when the most consistent experience I have with anti-feminists are them verbally abusing me. <laughs> so the, oh, the yeah, environment is really toxic. I've seen a lot of that. And I think there's a real difference between social media and real life. <laughs> Yeah. If I, um, one week I just ask every woman that I ran into, I said, how would you define feminism? And virtually all of them said, well, just equal rights. Uh, but if you uh, listen to some of the diatribes against you, uh, some of those real anti-feminist uh, videos, it, it's not that at all. Um, so I think there's a polarization that's even worse on social media than there is in, in real life. And I didn't realize how much that word had <laughs> um, changed, if you will, when I took the word faithless feminist. I was working with my marketing guy and um, coming up with a name for my blog. And the first one he came up with was Godless Grandmother. And I said, you know, let's not, let's not emphasize I'm a grandmother. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, 
so he came up with Faithless Feminist. And of course, I'm a second wave feminist, went through the 60s and 70s. And I wasn't aware of all the, the nuances and the third wave feminism and, and the things that had happened lately. So I've really, in the last couple of years, being on social media a lot, have educated myself. But I think it's really different than what um, somebody on the street would define feminism as. And, you know, you go, oh, maybe we should change the word or maybe we should just say gender equality. But uh, feminism has been around a long time, uh, the word, and I just, I just stick to it and I just explain it. And if somebody has a reaction, I try to engage in a dialogue with them about it. Well said. We'll move on to our second and last question for this episode. By the way, if you have questions that you would like answered by feminists, go ahead and leave them in the comment section below. They will be gathered and screened, and, and ones that are interesting and ask fair questions will be put through and be answered in the next episode. Right, so Obsian, um, oh no, I'm sorry, Os Ospian, my apologies, writes, I'm curious about the difference in social issues between the U.S. and U.K., like abortion. I found there's not so there's usually not much strong protest against it in the U.K., while I've heard the opposite from the U.S. I wonder why there's such a difference. Okay, well, the reason is that the United States is a much more religious country. Um, most people, the vast majority, identify themselves as, as religious although the category of nuns, and that's N-O-N-E-S, is growing. Um, and so what, you know, historically, kind of what happened when communism arose uh, in the 50s, there was this coming together between the then President Eisenhower and people like, um, you know, who were very uh, preachers, different things like that, um, you know, they... Uh, came together and decided that the way kind of to combat communism was religion. And so it was really the rise of the evangelicals um, during the 50s and 60s that increased the religiosity of the United States. Uh, and so what we have is a country where you turn on the TV and you will hear uh, in the news references to religion. Um, somebody will ask, gee, do you think it was a miracle or something like that if something happens? And, and you just don't, don't see that in Europe. So it's a much more religious country. And I guess I'll speak uh, from the UK side, uh, more from the, the political science side than the religious side. But because I've studied British history and British politics and US history and politics, another way that we can think about the differences is that the United States, when it was being it was growing, right? We had the time in the Western expansion, the Manifest Destiny, where we drove original people from the lands and claimed it as our own. And people were moving and expanding faster than the reach of government. And the federal government was far away in many places. A lot of places, you know, had to become states first to have official governments. And in those, those situations, you had still had social needs. The thing that kind of helped fill that besides like local government was the church you know the church became the community center it was where you helped out the poor members or people volunteered their time and so the role of the church not in the government of the life of america but in the everyday experience of americans think about and this came up in the hangout that i had on my channel recently the role of churches in the civil rights movement and the way that they played an important place where people could congregate and also as a, as a basis, a moral basis, right, for the movement. So the, the problem, or not the problem, but the difference, I think, lies in the fact that the churches took up much bigger roles in the social fabric of America, whereas in you know, the UK, you had a government that existed for a very long time and was combined with the state. To the, in the, the, the queen is the head of the church and all of these machinations where bishops were associated with the aristocracy and there's the house of lords and you know the, the church itself is kind of tainted by its association with religion and then you didn't really have the kind of fundamentalists in the UK I mean you had Scottish okay you had Scottish fundamentalists they were pretty fundamental <laughs> at points in, in time and very uh, stern and austere but the kind of power politically 
that the churches would wield didn't have nearly the kind of bottom-up connection, I think, than it does in the United States. So those are my thoughts on, on some of the differences from a church-state point of view. No, I think, I think those are valid. Uh, if you look at uh, the level of religion and what people say in Northern Europe and Europe and the UK, it's just people just don't associate with religion like they do in the United States. And part of that was the founding of the United States. There were a lot of people who came to be able to practice the religion they wanted to. So it does have a long uh, beginning. But I think in the 19th century, you know, you look at um, Robert Greene Ingersoll and Helen Gardner and other orators, um, they really kind of got rid of that uh, fire and brimstone and it was kind of on the decline. But the 50s with, you know, uh, godless communism, as I said earlier, and uh, trying to be, you know, uh, opposing them and different. It just seemed like this new evangelical movement arose that's really taken root in the United States that is really different than Europe. Yes, and the other thing is that Europe experienced two world wars on their soil. There's a reason why existentialism came out of Europe. There's a reason exactly. why, you know, Nietzsche and, uh, you know, the times that people were living in, that was a little bit earlier than the First World War. But there were there are philosophers on the continent in Europe. And what you get in the United States is, you know, pragmatism. <laughs> That's the kind of philosophy you get from America. So there, um, there were religious wars, there were the Napoleonic Wars, there was a lot of strife ex experienced. And, and especially, I think, the First World War and then the Second World War brought about, let's call it, you know, a modernization of outlooks. Whereas the United States, I think, was still kind of, you know, more in the Enlightenment view of things. We haven't really caught up across America with postmodernism. There is I think, vast sections of the United States where postmodernism hasn't quite quite sunk in yet. So I would definitely agree with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> okay. Well hey, let's talk about the book now that we have the questions and thank you to the two people who wrote the questions and sorry for the mispronunciations of your name. If you would like me to mispronounce your name, go ahead and again <laughs> write a question in the comment section. So for, now, Karen, you were on my channel for my series, An Atheist Ask, which I haven't done in a very long time, and I should do another one. Actually, I have one uh, planned for December. But at the time, the book was still coming together, and I think you were still, like, you'd just gotten a publisher or something, and I said, you have to come back when the book is out to promote <laughs> it, and here you are, and it's out, and you're here to promote it. So, yeah, give us a little bit of the background and sell the book. Tell us. Okay. It. Well, uh, it's kind of interesting. I, um, I'm retired. I was executive director of the Oregon State Bar, and I was having lunch with a friend of mine who is an author. She writes murder mysteries in the Pacific Northwest, and she said, Karen, you should really write a book. Well, it happened to be a couple of days after the United States Supreme Court issued its decision in Burwell v. Hobby Lobby. And in that decision, they said that this craft store, which is Hobby Lobby, um, they didn't want to provide certain forms of birth control under Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, because of their religious views. And the court, uh, five to four, those were the five Catholic men <clears throat> who voted yes, said, well, that's okay. And I was just livid. I thought, we fought for reproductive rights in the 60s. We got Roe v. Wade. What are we doing this for? And so I told my friend, well, I said, the only thing I could get, you know, upset about enough to write a book would be religion. And so that was the genesis of the idea. <clears throat> I decided to have people tell their personal stories. I started recruiting friends. I had a lot of friends who were atheists. And some wanted to write and some just didn't have the time. And then I started to join uh, organizations in the greater Portland area here in Oregon and reached out to people who were interested in writing. And they were already part of a secular humanist atheist group. So um, I had them join on. And then, then when I got pitched on publishing, uh, Kurt Volgen, the publisher, suggested I reach out and get a little more diversity. So I did that through social media. And I have a woman who was born in Zimbabwe, a woman who was from Peru. Um, so it, it, it gave it a little more diversity. Uh, but they're 22 women. They are all from the Judeo-Christian background. There are no ex-Muslims or, or Buddhists or anything in there. And they each tell their story of how they were raised. And some who were born in Europe 
and who came over as adults were raised much more secular and they tell their stories. And some of them are fundamentalists and they talk about how long it took to leave the religion and how the shame and guilt of religion and how they were, were raised still impacts them as adults. So there, there are a real variety of stories. Somebody was 17 when she wrote and somebody was 70. Um, all different states, all different walks of life. Uh, so as you read the anthology, you know, you're really going to get into one. You may skip the next one. Um, it really lends itself to that, that kind of reading. And it, was, it came out in mid-September. Uh, there's a paperback version. You can get all the different electronic forms. Uh, Nook, Kindle, Kobo, I learned, is uh, one in Europe and Canada. And there will be an audio version. It's not out yet. Yes, and you can and get it to, online. Yeah, yeah. And to remind anyone who's watching that uh, Christmas is coming up and perhaps there's a, a man or a woman in your life who might benefit from this book. So go ahead. The link to the Amazon page will be in the description box of this video. So go and have a look at Karen's book. Now, while you were talking, one of the things that um, came to mind was um, you mentioned the emotional struggles that these women have went through in different ways. And, and I haven't looked into it yet, but it seems to me that psychology really should be doing more investigation into the psychological damage mm -hmm. that children experience directly tied to religion. And I was wondering about your thoughts on that and maybe tying that to some of the women's experiences in the book, um, and at least in things that like really you know, touched your heart or made you really feel empathetic for what they had gone through. Well, and let me just read this excerpt from um, Ann Wilcox, which is the first essay. As I tried to let my beliefs go, my head seemed far ahead of the rest of me. I would think, that makes no sense. But I would be assailed by intense fear and doubt. I my old fears and beliefs still skulking inside like the biblical Leviathan, a sea monster that looked in the deep. I felt wrong, as though I had committed a terrible crime and I was going to be punished. And she talks a lot about the shame and the guilt. She said, not only we were taught we could commit sin, but that we were sin. And particularly as women, you know, the story of Eve, the fruit in the Garden of Eden, and all the things that the early church fathers, St. Augustine, Tertullian, and everyone said, um, about women and how that endured in the Christian tradition. Uh, Marlene Winnell is, a, uh, I think she might be a psychologist or a counselor, she wrote Leaving the Fold. And if you really want to get into the guilt and shame that religion brings and how hard it is to let go, that's a, that's a really good book to read. I had an idea, <clears throat> it was mostly after the election because of course, I was dumbfounded, just like everyone else, that Donald Trump won and is president-elect of the United States. But the statistics show that 52% of white women voted for Trump and something like uh, maybe 84, 94, something like that, I don't remember the specific statistic of black women, um, voted for Hillary. And so I started to take a look at what were the reasons uh, those people voted. Uh, the white women voted. And I think it would be really interesting to do a study, a psychological study, of putting women who identified as evangelical, who identified <clears throat> as highly religious, who are probably Republicans, were put in a blind study where they were asked to um, select pictures of whether, who would you rather go to? And it's a woman doctor, male doctor, et cetera. And see, compared to somebody who was not religious, whether they picked women as often as the other people do. Because you think that the whole monotheistic, all the Abrahamic religions, um, you know, they got rid of the goddesses <laughs> in a lot of different religions and cultures at the time. And so you pray to this male God. And in Christianity, of course, there you pray to the male God, the male Holy Spirit, and the male Jesus. And so you spend your whole life going, our father. Um, and you also have... Uh, are raised in some of these religions where the man is clearly the head of the household. Um, you uh, you obey him. Um, I've had people tell their stories about um, in the book about their mother speaking back to their father once, and the father grabbed him and said, "Don't ever do that again," and they never did. 
so I think the psychological impact on women, not only of the doctrine itself, but the way it's been implemented, um, I think a study of that, are they really free to choose? And I would say probably not psychologically. There are, there are a lot of discussions about implicit racism, just unconscious, you know, Im mm -hmm. implicit racism. And there's also implicit sexism. I mean, I'm, when you were telling, you're talking, I was reminded of an experience I had as a young girl when I was being taken to Catholic services. And there was some kind of church newsletter, you know, that they would hand out. And I was always desperate for something else to read besides the Bible. <laughs> so, so, Good um, for you. <laughs> yeah. And there was a, a kind of like a, not really a dear Abby, but get some advice from your priest, whatever. And the woman, it was a woman writer, and she said, I, I don't really feel connection with God the Father because I don't really kind of relate to that, but uh, I say um, like our mother who is who art in heaven, and is that okay? And the priest writing back actually quite liberally, yet that God doesn't really have a gender, and so you don't have to say our father, and that saying our mother would be fine. And I remember being really surprised at that. The idea of God being a woman was just like, you know, made me kind of go back on myself and try to imagine what that would be like because it had never occurred to me before. You know, and well, as you say, with the male authority figures um, and male leaders, basically, you know, mostly in our generation, for sure, more so in everyday life, you know, would women also are susceptible to the social message that men are competent leaders and women aren't? Yeah, you go ahead. Well, I think it's real interesting. Uh, the only mythology I had was uh, in senior in high school, probably in an English class, reading Edith Hamilton's book. And there were a pantheon of God and goddesses, and you learned about Venus, et cetera, but I you know, didn't remember any of that. What I've read in the last couple of years, though, is how arose in several cultures at the same time. And it's really fascinating. Um, I don't think there's a lot of disagreement. There, there was probably an early veneration of a woman as, as Mother Earth, goddess, um, you think back to the Paleolithic and think of them looking at the moon and the cycles of the moon and then matching the cycles of menstruation of the women. I mean, that had to be like, wow, look at that. How do they match up with the moon? That's really cool. Um, but clearly everyone knows there was uh, pantheons of God and goddesses. Well, in one of the earliest writings we have from the Mesopotamia area, there is the story of Marduk who is a male god, there's other male gods, uh, you know, his, uh, his bros, if you will. And then there's Tiamat, which is this kind of sea monster, which the Leviathan is modeled after. And he goes to the guys in this particular poem, myth, whatever you want to call it, and says, look, um, if I knock off Tiamat, can I be head god? And they go, oh, sure, okay. And so he cuts her in half and he creates the heavens and the earth. And obviously, a lot of the Old Testament is modeled on some of these. And if you think that the uh, people who kind of finalized the Bible were in Babylon hearing all these things uh, for 40 years, you can see why there's a, a lot of similarities. But the difference uh, in our perception of the world changed with that. Because with the goddess, there's this idea of cycles. There's the idea of you come from the earth, you return to the earth. Whereas in monotheism, it's much more linear. There's a beginning, there's an end, there's heaven, there's hell, there's all this duality that comes into it too. Uh, so the impact of switching uh, is, is very significant. And I think the Catholic Church in its veneration of Mary try to appeal to uh, some need for women to have some woman to worship. And so whether it's the Ascension or the Immaculate Conception or all of these different doctrines that arose to kind of elevate Mary, I think it was a response to that. And then finally, I'll say even in the Old Testament, uh, there's, I think it's in Jeremiah, where the women uh, are at the temple saying, look, things are going really bad. And when we had the queen of heaven, which could have been Asherah, Astarte, um, to pray to and bake her goods, et cetera, et cetera, things were going, well, we're going to go back to worship her. So you can see even in the Old Testament, there was that struggle. Um, and I think that has a long-term impact of having only a male to worship. 
I would agree with that. I think that, um, you know, I was actually just trying to look this up because, yeah, uh, I found it on Google. The Virgin Mary in all of the paintings that we have going back to the earliest forms of Christian art that was included people, she's wearing blue. And that's the symbol of, of vir the Virgin. And in fact, until very recent times, as I'm looking at this article, um, blue was actually a color for girls because it was associated with the Virgin Mary, whereas red was a royal color. It was a regal color. And so pink is just, you know, a lighter version of red. So boys wore, had, were dressed in pink or were associated with pink and girls were more associated with blue. And then that swapped. But um, linking it back to gender roles and gender norms in a place for, for both sexes, yeah, the, the um, inclusion of Mary and the veneration of Mary, I think, was very much in, an important part of pagan tribes readjusting themselves to a Christian Europe as, as Christianity spread northwards and eastwards and stuff. Well, uh, what else, is there anything else that you want to say about the book before we move on to critiquing some stories of associated with religion and feminism? No, I would just, I guess the one thing I would say is I think we all need models. I know when I was growing up, I saw women as secretaries, um, retail clerks, nurses, and teachers. And when you are surrounded by that, it, you know, it doesn't dawn on you to be a scientist. You never had a teacher who was a science teacher who was female. Um, and I, myself, I know my parents would have been very supportive if I said I wanted to be a doctor or something like that. But those things never occur to you. So we need models. And I think one of the reasons I wrote this book is so the women and men who are thinking of leaving religion can read somebody else's experience and say, oh, well, they can do it, so can I, or they had it harder than I did. Boy, it's going to be a piece of cake for me, or they raise some of the same issues I'm thinking about. Boy, that makes me feel more confident. So it's really an issue of, of assistance and having, having some other people to look at so you don't feel like you're alone. The other thing before we move on to the news stories that I remembered is that we wanted to talk about some of the reactions on both sides of the extremes that you've had to to the book and so yeah tell us a little bit about i mean we, there's i'm sure been a lot of positive reaction too and then maybe you want to talk about some of the criticism and what it what it contained well most of the reactions i've got is to my blog i started the blog a couple of years ago and it's called it's at www.faithlessfeminist.com i mostly write about women and religion and i do accept guest posts if people um, are interested in writing i'm always happy to have somebody else write a guest post um, but most of it is in reaction to that and what i do is i have subscribers but i also usually post my blog every week on probably 20 25 atheist facebook groups it's easy i just you know, post them there. Most of them allow that. And so that's where I get most of the reaction. And I've had it, yes, from both extremes. The first one was um, Shanna Babylonia, who writes at myobi.com. Uh, she and I decided to collaborate uh, on a on an article, and it was called Why We Need More Secular Men. And it wasn't a topic I normally would write about it, but she'd picked it, and, and we did it together, and I posted that on all the groups. And one of the atheist Facebook groups is called No Gods, No Masters, Atheist Feminists. And I got, you know, a little notification on my computer that somebody had made a comment. So I, I try to, you know, respond to the comments. <clears throat> and the people on it were women, and they were saying, this is a joke, right? And so I said, well, no, it's not a joke. It's, have you read the post? And uh, then they went on and on about how, oh, well, um, she, thinks, she thinks men are important. And I said, look, we wouldn't have gotten the right to vote if we hadn't worked with men. Men were the one, you know, uh, who, who supported us. We worked together. And they said things like, oh, she's going to go bake them cakes, I bet. <laughs> really sarcastic and demeaning. And I tried to respond. I think I was like there 10 minutes and they kicked me off the group. So that's uh, women on the extreme who don't think we need men. Then the other extreme is men who've had a bad experience. Maybe they got divorced and they didn't have a lot of money and they're paying child support and they think they should have gotten custody of the kids. Um, and even though divorce laws are changing, you know, especially with younger children, women still usually retain custody. 
and they react just to the word feminist. They don't read the post. They just react to the word feminist. And I try to respond to them by saying, well, you know, what happened to you or what particular, do you, do you agree that women should be paid the same men in the same job? Tiny, tease out a little about what they're meaning and try to educate people at the same time. So I get, I get both reactions. The the thing that's you know so strange to me is is how you can have how can you have a, a movement why is the idea of there being more secular men a bad thing on a group that's basically I would assume like uh, aligned with the idea of increasing secularism and declining religiosity in the United States clearly you can't just have all women do it you need to, so just the logic of it I mean I, maybe they were trolling you but or maybe they just were um, very young i'm assuming and haven't really thought about these things for a really long time haven't really experienced um ally what it's like to be a good ally and to work with other allies so um yeah that was like a i found that self-defeating and then on the other side guys who or women too i don't want to just limit it to to men but i think it's predominantly men if we looked at it by an aggregate of the population of, of people who are anti-feminist they don't see the atheism part, they just see the feminism part and kind of ignore all the rest of the stuff, again, to help encourage people to come to atheists or to, you know, be comfortable with identifying as atheists. Again, it's self-defeating. So, ah! <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I think one of the things this book does is really gives a perspective from women. I, uh, I was very pleased to receive a blurb on the book from Richard Dawkins, and I've got several others, Sakibu Hutchinson, Peter Bogosian, Valerie Tirico, just uh, a lot, John Loftus, a lot of great people who supported me in this book. But a lot of the writings of ath on atheism are, are by men. I did a survey of 100 top-selling books on atheism before I started this, and there were only six that were written by women. So I do think it feels, uh, fills a void there of having women write and talk about it. Uh, I think if you go on YouTube, most of the debates, if you have religion, they're between, you know, William Lane Craig and an atheist. There are very few women um, who engage in that form of a debate that I have seen anyway. So I hope this book encourages more women to write about their experiences and write about, write about atheism. I know that when I was thinking about doing my YouTube channel, one of the reasons that uh, eventually moved me from the couch to behind the editing software was the realization that I wasn't seeing the content I wanted to see. People weren't presenting on, and I was interested in feminist critique of religion, but it just like wasn't out there. And then I thought, oh, damn it, now I'm going to have to do it. <laughs> and, <laughs> well, you've done a great job. Yeah, well, no, thank you. Uh, but it is, the as you were saying about role models, you can't be what you can't see. And mm. because I'm at a point in my life where I've accomplished myself professionally, whether or not people like me on YouTube doesn't impact me in my daily life. But I know that it is important for people to step up in either mentor others or be a role model, show a way forward. And I know at least uh, one YouTuber, maybe even two, that have cited me as you know someone that got them thinking about getting involved or that they thought was you know, doing a good job. And that, that means the most because if I do a little bit to inspire someone to say, oh, I could do that, and she goes ahead and does it, or he, but you know, disproportionately, we used to have men already speaking. I don't want to say we don't need more men, but we just need more women. We don't need to stop men from speaking. We just need more women speaking. See, that was like the exactly. equality thing. It's not polarized. You're just adding more people. <laughs> well, know? and I think women women tell their experiences. And you know, the the specific example to me uh, is the kind of the best way of of showing something. As an example, people will say. Well, um, women make the same as men. And so I go, well, let me tell you about an experience I had. And uh, when I was director of the bar, we had a subsidiary that had its own separate board and the person left and they were hiring somebody new. And so I sketched out to them where my salary was, how many employees I had, where my managers were. And I said, peg that person right about here. And that would be fair because I had 90 employees. This person was going to have 40, um, had a narrow field of focus, et cetera. And lo and behold, they hired the person making $30,000 more than I did. 
And I said, whoa, wait a sec here. And so I went to my board and I had a woman on the board who was a lawyer who said, if you want me to represent you in a lawsuit, I will. <laughs> and the board said, we'll do a study. And they did, did a study and the consultant said, look, the only conclusion I can come to is sexism. There's a lot more responsibility than this man, et cetera. I got a $30,000 raise. Wow. And that was 10 or 12 years ago. Right. Um, so it's not that long ago that in that kind of a position, you would think, and they're lawyers, that they would have been educated not to do that. But you still, I, you know, it was kind of right before I retired. And I had to stand up for myself. I had to get people, you know, convinced to do the study and, and all of that stuff. So when people tell me, oh, you know, women have it great. They have more equity than men. I go, excuse me, let, let, let me tell you a story. And the other one I usually tell is when I was in college, I decided to go to grad school and I applied for a scholarship to Dartmouth. Now, this was in the 70s. And the committee that interviewed me, the only woman on the committee said, after I had answered all the questions, why should we give it to you? You just get married and have kids. <laughs> so, you know, wow. we were talking earlier about women's own perception of their equality. <laughs> There's a good example. You know, was she frustrated yeah. that she couldn't go on or something? And of course, I didn't get the scholarship. I, you know, I went to grad school anyway. But um, those are specific concrete example, examples that have happened to me. So I say we're not quite there yet, folks. The other thing, too, that because people are so busy debating whether or not the wage gap exists when it does, is that they never get to the point of looking at solutions. And a really easy solution is pay transparency. That doesn't hurt anybody. It just lets everybody know what everybody else is making and asks management, explain your decisions. Exactly. And so often in the private sector um, where there's no union uh, or in the public sector where you usually know um, what people are making, um, it's really the salary you get at that first when you start. And if you start at a company and you don't know what the other people are making and you don't negotiate real well, you may be affected forever. That's not really fair. I mean, it's just a random thing, you know. Or maybe somebody came in, yeah, like you said, was a better negotiator or they had a little bit more volunteer experience or they liked them better or they, they knew their dad. You know, you never really know all the factors that go into it unless you can see. And that might force a lot of companies. To, I mean, in Germany, I'm a public servant. If you know how much experience I have and how much education uh, I have, you can work out what band I'm in. People in a band make a certain range, you know, and it has to, it goes up over time because of things like, you know, CPI and um, I, I get seniority uh, bumps as well. And then I move up to another level. So just be transparent. And that would go, well, I think, a long way. And, and that uh, I've had um, experiences where men had the same thing happen to them. You know, they started out in a position and they didn't know they were supposed to negotiate and they find five years later, somebody's making a lot more money than them. So the transparency could help everybody. Yeah. And they should have rational reasons for putting people at different salaries. But there are some companies where you may not talk about your pay. And sometimes you can get disciplined for talking about your pay. Yes. Yes. Like it's a state secret or something. Exactly. And that's the well. It's hard to have hard to have equality when you don't even have the data. Yeah. Yes. And the other thing that you know, a lot of times the wage gap is framed in terms of men and women, but there are there are ethnic components to it as well. And if you get into the cross tabs, so you have the average, and that's the whole population. You know, the average men, all men, and the average women, all women. And then you can look at it by cross tabulation, where you would put it by men and women, and also by ethnicity. And you see, again, in this case, you know, white men are the base and everyone else makes relatively less to that group. And then you get into inferential statistics where you control for things like education and part of the country that you live in, and they still find a wage gap. And if you look around for studies that explain 100% of the wage gap, you won't. I think the closest a study has gotten in terms of an economic study that took all the factors still said there was like a 5% amount of variance that was unexplained. Hmm. But it was different Interesting. between men and women. Eight to five percent. I've seen like that range, like the, that as being the smallest. You know, if we focus on the solutions, if we focus on the solutions, and it doesn't exist, then nobody's harmed, right? Exactly. <laughs> if we talk about things like pay transparency, that's not going to harm anyone. So instead of debating whether or not something exists, exists, 
let's just talk about, let's move on to the solutions. Let's just take everyone, okay, let's just say that, you know, it will put in the solutions and if it makes no difference, then all those people who are arguing that it was a myth were right. So let's conduct an experiment. Well, let's be scientists about this. <laughs> and I, I really feel that religion is the last cultural barrier to gender equality. And we also need to look outside Europe and outside the United States. I mean, part of this education process is saying not only what religion does here, but what is religion doing in the Middle East? How are women treated? We've got femina, uh, female genital mutilation. We have honor killings. We have all of these uh, women can't drive in Saudi Arabia. So we're all in this together. And so I, I, I don't like to get too much in an argument about a focus in one country about one specific issue, because when you look across the globe, we have such a long way to go. Right. And on the issue of, patri of uh, wage equality, there are global studies and countries do better and worse on that on that metric. So it is, we're talking about it in terms of the U.S. just because I know that data better, but uh, it is a global phenomenon and it impacts, you know, people's household income on a daily basis. Well, and Iceland is one of the countries that has the highest uh, gender equity on pay and it's one of the least religious. I was in Iceland a couple of years ago and somebody said, well, the clerics didn't come over until about 1000 AD <clears throat> to spread Christianity and uh, people bought into it because they needed the trade goods and stuff, but they kept all their old uh, gods and goddesses. <laughs> so I think religion took a little less in Iceland than it did elsewhere too. <laughs> and you're right, culturally, if you don't think that women should work outside the home, it's really difficult to get equality in pay. It can't just be on a legal level. You also have to have a culture that embraces the idea of that basic level of equality that all humans have the right to similar treatment, equal treatment, uh, opportunities without discrimination based on a whole set of characteristics. Exactly. Um, thank you for that chat. That was, that was interesting. And thanks for sharing your experiences as well. Moving on to our news section, we're going to talk about some stories that I've picked out this time. And they're mostly uh, centered around women and religion or religion and, and women in the state. First story is, New York preacher pregnant out of wedlock says she won't step down from the pulpit. This is from christiannews.net. A female preacher in New York who has become pregnant outside of wedlock says she won't step down from the pulpit, stating she is not, quote, sorry or ashamed, unquote. Recently, Ellen, who is engaged to be married, wrote a blog post outlining that she had discovered in May that she had become pregnant with twins. Her post entitled, On Being a Pastor and Pregnant, and why I can't carry your weight was written in part to express her feelings about the weight she carried. Sorry, the uh, the weight she carried having to face those in the church who shame those having sexual relations outside of marriage. Quote, "Let's face it, the church has not had a good track record of accepting unmarried women who got pregnant. If you've been in church for any period of time, you've heard or witnessed the aftermath." shunning, slut-shaming, being sat down from your position, having to go in front of the church and confess your sin, etc., etc., Alan said. She said she had been told at one point that fornication was an abomination to God, but shrugged it off as antiquated language. Quote, so when the first comment was made about my pregnancy being an abomination, I wasn't bothered because it wasn't my truth. Plus, who uses abomination anyway? Can we say antiquated? <laughs> Unquote. Uh, Karen, so getting back to the idea of women, women in religion and that knock on effect into wider society, would you like to pick up on the news story? Sure. Well, I, I often say it's all been downhill since agriculture. Um, you know, if we look at the history of, you know, people becoming settled in villages, you know, 10,000 years ago, starting to have to protect their fields against other people and defend them and the property rights, it's kind of understandable what happened that the person, you know, the man wanted to pass the property and men owned property. They wanted to pass it on to their son. So they needed to know that the son was theirs. So we have all these issues of you have to be a virgin when you're married and there can't be adultery and all of those things. Well, we still, you know, we still have a legacy of that. Um, as she says, very antiquated that um, just because she got pregnant, and it's interesting that she's marrying the father of the child, um, which it, it doesn't really matter one way or the other, but um, 
And so we ended up with all of these anti-women um, uh, doctrines in the church. And we talked earlier about, you know, the idea of sin. And it wasn't so much in the Old Testament, but boy, in the Catholic Church, St. Augustine basically said carnal lust, which is leading up to this article, carnal lust is the cause of sin and women uh, are the cause of carnal lust. So this whole idea of sex, it's totally taken out of context. Um, you think back to um, how, what a natural process it is, and the church has totally distorted it. I think one of the real problems with religion is its attitude towards sex. Uh, I never, my parents never talked to me about sex. I had no sex education. Um, so it's not surprising that an issue of getting pregnant outside of marriage, which is, you know, a no-no for 10,000 years, gets talked about in the church, and it's totally ridiculous. Uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's hard to even address something that would shame a woman because she got pregnant. I always thought, a good argument against Jesus being a really great philosopher or even fully divine while still being fully man, which makes no sense, is the fact that he gave really dumb teachings. Like to look <laughs> at a woman with lust in your heart is the same thing as having sex with her adulterously. Instead of saying, look, guys, you're human beings. You're going to get urges. Here's how you handle them. Here's how you treat people with respect, including women. Here's how you don't externalize your sexual frustrations onto other people, but you deal with them um, in, in a way that's healthy and for your, it recognizes the way your body works and your mental state. A, a really good, insightful person would have given better advice than um, having a thought that you can't even necessarily control is a sin and the connection that that makes with externalizing it onto all women's bodies and the then power connection of trying to control women's bodies to not experience sin as opposed to controlling your own thoughts or dealing with your thoughts in a healthy way. Well, and it's like the issue of the woman being stoned. And he says, uh, purportedly, um, those without sin cast the first stone. But he didn't say, let's get rid of this um, stoning for adultery. I mean, he didn't end the practice. Right. And there's no commandment against rape. So, yep. uh, you know, the misogyny continues. Definitely. And those attitudes, when they're taught in, on a weekly basis to young children and then prepubescent teens and then teens, that's going to lead to, as we were tying it back to earlier, these psychological issues of repression and guilt and shame and fear, which I'm sure over the centuries of human existence, or millennia of human existence, has led to people having really terrible sex lives for no good reason. Oh, absolutely. I mean, as I said earlier, I was never taught. I, I purloined my sister's copy of Harold Robbins, 79 Park Avenue, and uh, the shopkeeper rapes a young girl. That's how I figured out what intercourse was. Oh, God. And then, of course, it was in junior high, and somebody was talking in the hallway about whores, and I said, it's not whores, it's war. It's W-H-O-R-E. You know, the academic once and for always, right? Right. <laughs> but I had... You know, I had no sex education, and I wasn't even part of a community where the girls got together and talked about it. I mean, you didn't even talk about it. It's totally ridiculous, and it affects your attitude toward sex, toward the opposite sex forever. Have you seen the series Masters of Sex? I have heard about that. It's In phenomenal. fact, my son just recommended it to me. Okay, well... And say, don't watch it with anyone other than a significant other because it gets pretty steamy <laughs> in places. <laughs> but what you are talking about in terms of the ignorance surrounding sex, not just with kids, but even with adults. And it's a really, especially the first season where they're breaking new ground and doing a biological medical examination of the human body physically during sex. The social norms that they discuss in the story are so close and yet so far you know mm. they're the 1950s that's not that long ago and yet attitudes towards homosexuality attitudes towards sex the complete ignorance of female orgasms uh, you know there's just it's you, when you watch the rest of the series you know you in some ways it's, it's a bit of a sex education course 
itself because it's taking on a medical history um, documentary in some ways, fictionalizing it. But the attitudes in many ways are what's more fascinating and seeing people grapple with this desire. As a scientist, I can, I can relate to this. The desire to understand and to know. Well, but it, it, imagine, you know, doing it, being called a pervert because I wanted to study political science. But that's what he was facing. He was being called in fear of being called a pervert because he wanted to do this kind of well, research because it was sex. Well, in May, I attended the Reason Rally in D.C. and the Secular Coalition of America organized a lobbying effort the two days before that night, participated in one of them. And it was to talk about medically appropriate sex education because federal dollars go to abstinence-only education. And I think that's just, uh, frankly, unconstitutional that we're supporting um, what is totally a religious view about sex education in public schools, and we're giving our federal tax dollars to it. So we ended up talking mostly to staff people, but we, uh, there were three of us from Oregon, and we went to the, um, to the representatives and talked about the need for medically appropriate, accurate sex education, because the bottom line is whether you have sex education or not, you're going to have sex. So you're either going to know about it, you're, no going, to, you're going to know to be um, to have birth control, you're going to know about uh, sexually transmitted diseases or not, but you're going to have sex anyway. And there are a lot of studies been done on that. So let's educate people about it. Um, but this is a thousands year old taboo about sex outside of marriage and culture sometimes changes very slowly. Yes. You can have laws, but it doesn't mean people are going to implement them. You know, you can have, and, and the th yeah, so getting back, well, I totally agree. I, I don't even think it should be an issue that the states should get to decide. I think there should be a federal law that says that all teens in the United States will have medically accurate, age-appropriate sexual health information taught to them, including, you know, a whole bunch of issues on sexual health and pregnancy, prevention of pregnancy, um, how to get tested, consent, um, rape laws in their state and rape laws, the history of rape laws, um, and notions of sexual assault and myths that various, you know, both men and women face when filing a rape complaint. I mean, I, I don't even think that it should be an option because every child in America deserves that information, it will inform their entire life, as you say, because just because we're not comfortable, or some people, not we, but some people are uncomfortable having teenagers who aren't legally yet adults learning explicit things about sex, as you point out, they're going to get older. Those people are going to become 20-somethings and 30-somethings, and you can give them information at that point in their life that will guide them. Now, I have to say, I don't know what's happening in Wisconsin schools uh, now because I've not lived there for a long time. But when I grew up, we had medically accurate sexual health education. I mean, we went over STIs and, you know, we had a health book that had um, very grossed out pictures, not excessively gross. It wasn't designed to put you off sex, but they were medically accurate. And I learned things about, you know, some tests, um, some kinds of infections can only be tested with a blood to test. Other ones can be done with a smear. Um, you know, learning a thing, for instance, in all schools that if a woman takes antibiotics and is on birth control, her antibiotics might cause her birth control to fail. Why? <laughs> this, this is stuff that you should like be taught in schools, not just hope that your doctor remembers to mention if you've never heard that before. I'm not even sure. I, I'm not even sure I knew that. When I was, um, oh, let's see, I was in high school. My brother got married, had to get married. His girlfriend was pregnant. And back in the 60s, you got married. And I remember going up to my older sister. She's seven years older than I am. And looking at her and said, I didn't think Colleen was that kind of a girl. And bless, bless her heart, my sister said, what do you mean, that kind of a girl? How about, how about Keith? How about what he did? Uh, but I had that attitude right. in high school that it was her fault that she got pregnant. And you didn't get that independently. You didn't come up with that opinion. Of course on your not. Own. Right. Of course not. Uh, but I, I just remember that specifically standing in her bedroom or telling me that because I was totally shocked that she was responding to what I said. And what an antiquated, to coin the phrase from the article you read earlier, attitude. It was the girl's fault. Hello? <laughs> anyway. No, I think you're right. These are the, you know, 
unconscious influences that until they're challenged or you're met like I was in that newsletter with someone who was farther along the path, older and, you know, had more questions than I had even thought to form at age eight or whatever I was, that you could have pray to God, our mother, you know, and again, you know, it's that whole, you can't be it until you see it. And what you're used to is one way of looking at the world. You can't really be blamed for not looking at it any other way. <laughs> um, but then I think it's taking some mental suppleness to consider alternative worldviews. And I think well, some people are better at that than others. Well, sometimes, and I, I'm 66, and I've been an atheist probably for two decades. But sometimes when I go to sleep and lay my head on the pillow, I start going, now I lay me down to sleep, pray the Lord my soul to keep. You know, it just comes out um, after how many years? It, it, indoctrination, and <laughs> it, it sticks with you. If I'm sure if I went to a Catholic Mass, there are bits of it that I could still recite right along with the rest of the congregation. Yeah. Well, my sister and I were in the car going somewhere a while ago. She was visiting, and we decided to sing hymns. And so we spent the whole time singing hymns. And we remembered all the words. We even remembered some of the different, you know, the alto soprano parts. <laughs> and, and it's been, what, you know, 40 years since I've done that. So it's, it, yeah. it does stick with you. I think what you learn as a child gets implanted deeper than anything else. Definitely. I think it was some quote, it was attributed to the Jesuits, but I'd have to check to make sure about, you know, give me the child until he's seven and I will give you the man. Yes. All right. So speaking of the Catholic Church, as I am one to do when I talk about my childhood, Vatican newspaper, Allow Women to Preach. This was written by Maureen Fielder and it comes from NCR Online. She writes, and this is also from March of this year. I was stunned when I read the story on Religion News Service website, March 2nd, entitled Vatican Newspaper Essay Says Women Should Pre Preach at Mass. And yes, the publication in which this appeared was uh, some Italian word I don't want to pronounce, the semi-official Vatican newspaper. I had several reactions simultaneously as I read this. Well, 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 the Vatican is finally catching up with, the f with part of the 21st century. Women already preach in a lot of places, usually unofficially, but they do. Maybe now they'll get official recognition and regular preaching opportunities on Sundays. Women are top-notch theologians, authors, speakers, and pastoral care workers. There is no reason they should be barred from preaching. I wondered what the conservatives in the Vatican think about this idea, in an official newspaper no less. The article describes the situation inside the Vatican as delicate. I wonder when the Vatican will recognize dialogue homilies in which anyone present at the Eucharist can share his or her reflections. I'll stop there, but you guys can always read more in the link below. This just gets to the issue of the way that churches, and in this case, the Catholic Church, views women. Karen, well, your thoughts? What's interesting is uh, in, the New, in the New Testament, you have uh, several women, Priscilla's one that comes to mind, who opened their houses to the Jesus followers, and they were participating in it. You have Fecla, um, other personalities in the first, uh, you know, two or three centuries, but it, it didn't take them very long to exclude women and to have it a totally male-dominated priesthood. And I would be very surprised if the Catholic Church, I think Pope Francis has said he's not going to do that, um, would, would switch. And I... <sighs> You know, I know there are women who are very religious and aren't interested in leaving, but I'm not going to spend any of my time focusing on reforming religion because it's a mythology. We should let it go. We should use reason and science to, to guide our lives. We can be totally moral human beings without the Ten Commandments. Um, so I guess uh, let those people fight that battle out within the church, but it's, it's not really my focus. Right. I have a slightly different take. I wouldn't say I disagree. I just have a different perspective, which is, to me, I think the more that we undermine the very core foundations of religious claims to truth and knowledge about what the world is, how it works, and what we're here for, the more the whole facade starts to crumble. And so I'm kind of more on the line of the more people that we can get questioning the sexism not only in Islam, that's easy, and that's also um, over there, 
you know, it's not associated with our culture and implications for our culture, but to turn that also on the, on the Catholic church, the Christian churches and challenge their worldview with a egalitarian worldview, with a secular worldview, with one based on humanism and demand that they explain why, why humanism isn't better considering the way it benefits everyone, not just certain groups. And break that down into like basically move them over into a cre increasingly liberal Christian position to where they're um, you know, Unitarian Universalists, <laughs> which is basically one step away from atheism. So, you know, for me... Well, there's a, there's a woman in Canada, I don't know if you've heard of her, her name's Greta Vosper, and she is a preacher who's an atheist. And now that the church, uh, somebody complained to the church or whatever, um, they're considering removing her from her post, but she has the support of the whole congregation. I mean, they love her. So that's even going to a further extreme. And there is a pastor in a Presbyterian church in the greater Portland area that I met with is also an atheist and his congregation knows he's an atheist. So there you go. <laughs> One of the things I first came across when I started to watch YouTube videos on atheism was Dan Barker and his movement that reaches out to people who are in ordained ministers in whatever denomination who realize that they're atheists but are trapped in the job because they don't have any other skills. And he started a website that was devoted to basically closeted atheist pastors and priests and it grew into a nonprofit where they raise money to help give these people the um, skill sets or some education so they can transition out of religious life into secular life. Yeah, That's it's called really the, clergy, the Clergy Project. Yeah, yeah. and it's, um, I haven't heard about it for a while, and I haven't seen much on it, at least you know, in the circles that I move in on YouTube. But for people who might not be familiar with that in the audience, it's definitely something that deserves, you know, some if some support if you're thinking about, you know, giving money in lieu of a gift for someone for the holiday season. <laughs> you might well, and they have a, they have an active organization. Um, I've met some of the people involved, and they have a blog, um, and they do have uh, an organization that's still active to doing exactly what you said. So somebody just needs to Google the clergy project, and they'll find it. They were kind enough to do a. Um, an uh, independent review of my book. I really appreciated it. Oh, that's great. Have you seen the video of the woman who was a minister somewhere who came out as an atheist at the at a conference? No, I haven't. Oh, send I, me the link. I'd love to yeah. see that. Yeah, and it's very moving because she talks about how she was preaching against everybody in the audience and what she used to say about them. And then, yeah, and then how she started to question and turn it around. And, yeah, so it's a really great talk. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll also link it in the description box below. So. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Right. So then I guess we're moving on. And the last one has to do with, you know, I, I grew up in the second wave and didn't really realize there was a third wave until probably about the early 2000s, 2006, 2007, and got on board right away, but I'm still uh, in many ways a second wave feminist because of my concerns on politics and laws and the legal status of access to things like reproductive health care in the United States. So for me, the role of con the state con in women's lives is, is very important. And I think, you know, intersectionality and third wave tends to focus more on society and culture. But that's kind of how I'm in classifying myself as a as an old school intersectional feminist, I guess, with my emphasis. But I will read the article and then it'll become obvious why I just did that little setup. Texas will now require funeral services whenever a woman has an abortion. In June, anti-choice activists in Texas suffered a serious setback in their attempts to make abortion as miserable as possible for women. Sorry, this is from salon.com, by the way. That was when the Supreme Court overturned a series of medically unnecessary regulations enacted for no other reason than to make abortion more onerous, time-consuming, and expensive for women. In early July, state health officials quietly proposed new rules requiring to what amounts to funeral arrangements any time a woman loses or terminates a pregnancy outside of her home. Now the funerals for embryos rule will be in effect before the end of this year. Even when 
The embryo is so small as to be invisible, as David Brown, a staff attorney for the Center of Reproductive Rights, explained over the phone. The doctor or healthcare provider will still have to treat it like a dead person and hold some sort of burial or cremation for it. We see the rule as one more attempt by Texas politicians to pile on the burdens on women seeking medical care for miscarriages or abortion, Brown added. The new law appeared to be an unsubtle attempt to shame women who failed to bring a pregnancy to term, regardless of whether they wanted to terminate it or not. That alone is reason to oppose it. But Brown says he is also worried about the law's impact on women's ability to get timely and safe medical care. Quote, it might dissuade women who need medical care from seeking medical treatment, unquote, he notes. The law exempts women who abort or miscarry at home, after all. If a woman starts to miscarry at home, but knows she may be forced to pay for funeral services if she goes to a hospital for help, she might stay home and hope that the failing pregnancy works itself out on its own. There's already significant evidence that a large number of Texas women are turning to DIY abortion methods rather than go to a doctor. The most popular method is using miso, well, misoprotozole. Is that the correct pronunciation, Karen? Do you know? Oh, I don't know. Okay, well, that was my guess. A drug that can induce miscarriage either bought over the counter in Mexico or from a black market dealer who buys in bulk and brings it over the border. While it is relatively safe and effective, women who take it run the danger of having an incomplete miscarriage and infections, which is why doctors prefer it be taken under medical supervision. The article goes on, but for time and copyright, I'm going to end it there. Uh, Karen, you're, you said at the start that you know the issue of, of abortion access and contraceptive access for women, the fights, you're still fighting them. That started out the book, um, and we're still fighting. It's absolutely amazing to me. Um, now, is this a bill that's been introduced or it's was actually it actually a rule? So it's like an administrative rule that has been written by state health okay. officials. So it was uh -huh. never passed. It was never had a hearing. Nobody okay. ever voted on it. It's an administrative rule, I think. It'll probably be challenged and be ruled unconstitutional. I, or, or maybe the legislature will overturn it. You know, I, I've had a miscarriage. I had a miscarriage before I had our son. And it's such a traumatic experience to say, you know, and for me, it was, I just learned I was pregnant. I was trying to get pregnant for a year and then you, you start bleeding and you go back and it's such a traumatic experience to think they're going to add something onto that to add to the grief. I mean, I don't know how much more insensitive people could be to women than that. I mean, it's, it's more, it, it's just sad. It's just sad that people could be that mean and so lack of understanding of, of the trauma involved in either a miscarriage or an abortion. And I've had an abortion too. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes I think we're just going back to the Middle Ages. I, and I, I don't have a lot of occasion to sit down and talk to people who do that. But somebody do, it needs to. I mean, somebody needs to sit down with these people and say, look, I'm a woman. I had a miscarriage. Here's what you're asking me to do. And are you really that insensitive? Are you really that uncaring of the trauma I'm going through? You're going to make me do this. When it's a, it's a little cell, you know, at nine weeks, ten weeks, it's, you can hardly even identify it. And, and the worst thing, as you mentioned out, people aren't going to go to the hospital or to a clinic and... Uh, generally, when you have a miscarriage, they like to flush it out so they've got everything, so there's no chance of infection. Women aren't going to do that, and they're going to have problems. And, of course, what is the big um, rationale or motive behind these attempts? Shame and guilt. Yep, driven by religious beliefs. Absolutely. And it's so easy to tie the threads of atheist critique, feminist critique, and bad outcomes that we can observe day-to-day -day, based on patriarchal norms well you're the image that appears to me on this audio from the google hangout is i think it's a renoir painting and i've been staring at it this whole time and there's a woman in a long skirt in a bustle at a at a park and on the one hand i want to say well we've come a long way from that but you know we still have a long way to go definitely the struggle continues Always and forever. Hopefully not. I mean, it, it would be nice if the United States got to the point where they were more European. Although, I mean, Europe's not all that crazy liberal about abortion laws either. It's not 
um, you know, Ireland, for instance, it's um, you can't get access there. And yeah, so it's quite spotty around Europe, women's um, access to medically, you know, safe and legal abortion providers is a problem, you know, I think, all over the world, really. I don't know if it's sort of ideal uh, anywhere, but I guess better and worse. Well, we've come to the end of the articles and the questions, and we had the chat about the book. And I've had so much fun chatting with well, you, Karen. So have I, Christy. It's so nice being on again. And you've done a great job and really increased your subscribers and are branching out into new areas. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> well, likewise, you, a uh, woman rocking the world on your, your, your very book-promoting sort of web tours and other appearances. I've seen your name on quite a lot of other podcasts <laughs> and shows, and it always gives me a smile. So um, what is uh, your plans for the future I guess you know this I know what it's like when you had a big project that's taken up a lot of your mental space and your emotions especially when it goes on for years my PhD was that for me and then you get to the end of it and there's a there's all this space left over so what are you going to do with that space well the space is pretty filled I'm already starting book two um, I've got a great group of women um, many of whom are professional authors who've already written books who are atheists and this is going to be more of a a uh, set of essays are more persuasive than personal. Um, Abby Hafer is going to talk about all the biological issues, like there is no intelligent design, in case you've looked at your body recently. Uh, Valerie Tariq is going to write about reproductive rights. I have a couple of women who are ex-Muslim. I have um, a couple of Hispanic atheists. And so I'm already starting to put that together. So no rest for the weary. Uh, well, I'm happy to hear it. I would actually have it no other way after your first book and um, how well it's gone and I think the contribution that it's going to make, uh, then I'm really pleased to hear there's a, a second book not only planned but being constructed in the works as we speak. Well, for anyone, again, who is interested in perhaps giving a book about women's experiences leaving religion as help to somebody that they know around the holiday season, you can go ahead underneath in the description box and click on the link that'll take you to the Amazon page. Karen, can you give us the website where they can find you and your blog again? Oh, it's www.faithlessfeminist.com. Thank you so much. And to those of you who have stuck with us all the way to the end of the at this third episode of Feminist Talk Back, I've been Christy. You've been awesome. Thanks for your time and attention. And I will be seeing you again really soon. Bye-bye. And oh, well, bye from Karen, too, right? Bye. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Bye from Karen, too. <laughs>